Hi, I'm the History Guy. I have a degree in history and I love history. And if you love history too, this is the channel for you. Of all the important names of history, few shake the world as much as the name Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte shook Europe not just with the force of his armies, but also with his ideas, which far outlived his battles, and in many ways he brought Europe into the modern age. But the House of Bonaparte did not die with his exile. Though maybe not as well known, his nephew, Emperor Napoleon III, was the longest serving French head of state since the French Revolution. But it is the end of the imperial ambitions of the House of Bonaparte that is perhaps least well known. For hopes of restoring the French Empire died with a promising and dashing young prince in a field in South Africa. It is a story of the era. It is a question of what might have been. The death of Louis Napoleon, Prince Imperial, deserves to be remembered. Napoleon Bonaparte was born in Corsica to a family of minor Italian nobility. He attended the elite Ecole Militaire in Paris and became an officer of artillery in the French army. He supported the Republican movement in the violent years following the French Revolution and leveraged the opportunities of the tumultuous period. He was a brigadier general by the age of 24. In 1799, at the age of 30, and bolstered by hero status for his many battles won, he engineered a coup d'etat and became first consul of France. Continued victories over Italy and Austria solidified his position. In 1804, he declared himself emperor. While he is most remembered for his generalship, his most important impact was really in his reforms. He established a central bank, a tax code, a system of higher education, and most importantly, a civil code, which changed civil law at the time, focusing on clearly written and accessible law. His reforms reached farther than his empire. But the creation of an empire required an heir. In March of 1810, he married his second wife, Marie Louise, Archduchess of Austria, and they produced a son, Napoleon Francis Joseph Charles, the Prince Imperial, who was given the title King of Rome. Upon his defeat at the Battle of Waterloo, June 18th of 1815, Bonaparte was forced to abdicate, and the young prince became the titular Emperor of France, Napoleon II. But the coalition that had defeated his father refused to accept a Bonaparte on the throne, and he was forced into exile. He lived in Austria and chose a military career, but died childless of tuberculosis at the age of 21. The new heir to the House of Bonaparte was Napoleon II's 23-year-old cousin, Charles Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, the son of Napoleon Bonaparte's younger brother Louis. There was still a significant Bonapartist movement in France, a faction seeking to restore the power and stability of the Bonaparte Empire. Louis Napoleon believed that ruling France was his destiny. He studied as an artillery officer, like his famous uncle, in the Swiss Army, and led two unsuccessful coups trying to regain the throne of France. After the French Revolution of 1848, he was seen as a champion of the people, and the Napoleon name still carried weight. He was elected to the National Assembly, and in December of 1848 was elected the first president of the Second French Republic in the nation's first election of its leader by popular vote. Barred by the French Assembly from running for a second term, he organized a coup d'etat in 1851 and proclaimed himself emperor of the Second French Empire. But the newly crowned Emperor Napoleon III had the same problem that his uncle did. An empire requires a line of succession. He married the beautiful Eugenie du Montijo, Countess of Teba, in 1853. And in 1856, they had a son who they named Napoleon and gave the title Prince Imperial. Like his uncle, Napoleon III was a reformer. He liberalized the French economy, invested in infrastructure, reformed the schools, and restored to workers the right to strike. His reforms made him popular, but his power slowly declined due to the cost of his expansionist foreign policies and his declining health. In 1870, his empire went to war with Prussia. His son, just 14 years old, joined him on campaign, but as the war shifted against France, his father sent him to the border with Belgium. When Napoleon III was defeated and captured by the Prussian army at the Battle of Sedan, his empire was overthrown. The Prince Imperial and his mother went into exile in England, followed by the Emperor himself after a brief captivity in Prussia. His health declined, and Napoleon III died of pneumonia in January of 1873. At the age of 17, Napoleon, the Prince Imperial, was proclaimed Napoleon IV by the still-influential Bonapartists. 
He was a promising contender to restore their hopes of returning to Bonapartist rule. He was energetic and handsome. He attended the British Military Academy at Woolwich, excelled in riding and fencing, and followed his father and uncle's footsteps, being commissioned an officer of artillery, a distinct anomaly being a French prince in the British Army. In 1879, England went to war with the Kingdom of Zululand in South Africa. It was a war of expansion that was instigated by the British on flimsy pretenses. The Prince Imperial, then a lieutenant in the British Army, desperately wanted to go to war, but the army was reticent. They didn't want to take responsibility for him if he got hurt. It took the personal intervention of his mother Eugenie and Queen Victoria herself, and the army finally acquiesced and sent the Prince Imperial to South Africa, placing him on the staff of a colonel of engineers where they thought he would be safe. But he was impetuous and headstrong. In June of 1879, he accompanied a scouting expedition into Zululand. The group didn't have a full escort because the prince was impatient. Another officer, Lieutenant Carey, was supposed to be in charge and to protect the prince, but the prince easily dominated Carey, and they rode deep into Zululand. They stopped at an abandoned crawl or Zulu farmstead to do some sketches of the terrain, and they were attacked by surprise by a group of about 40 Zulu warriors. As they tried to escape, the prince's horse bolted. He was able to hang onto the saddle, gripping the pistol holder he had tied to it, but eventually the strap broke and he was trampled by the horse. The small party of cavalry had been scattered and was unable to form a defense. Left behind, the prince wielded his revolver with his left hand, his right arm having been shattered when it was trampled by the horse. He was struck by a spear in his thigh. He removed the spear and fought with it. Another spear struck his shoulder, but he fought on. In the end, exhausted by his wounds, he was overwhelmed. When recovered, his body had 18 spear wounds, including the fatal one, which had gone through his right eye and pierced his brain. The last hope of restoring the Bonaparte dynasty died there, in a remote part of South Africa, wearing a British uniform. The prince's body was recovered and returned to England. The sword that he was carrying, which had been carried by his great uncle at the famous Battle of Austerlitz, was returned by the Zulus in a last-ditch attempt at peace. Queen Victoria herself attended his funeral, and his body was placed in a crypt in St. Michael's Abbey in Hampshire, along with the body of his father and any last hope of restoring the Second French Empire. The prince's death raised a sensation in Europe and gave rise to a number of conspiracy theories claiming that he had been murdered or set up. The British army was held at fault and Lieutenant Carey's career was ruined. The death of the Prince Imperial ended the power of the Bonapartist movement in France, but there is still a legacy. Even today there is a Bonapartist movement, which supports not just the memory of the Emperor's Napoleon, but the idea of a French empire run by Republican principles. The current heirs to the House of Napoleon are all descendants of Napoleon I's younger brother, Jerome. The current claimant is Jean Christophe, Prince Napoleon, who has an MBA from Harvard and is an investment banker in London. Coincidentally, Arthur Morrington, a descendant of the Duke of Wellington, who defeated Napoleon at Waterloo, is an investment banker for a rival bank. It's interesting to think of what might have happened if the prince had not died that day. If he had lived, would he have changed the future of France, and maybe the world? Certainly his death eliminated one of the thorniest issues of secession of the day in Europe. But no one can deny that he died a brave death, a warrior in the tradition of his father and great uncle. All 18 of his wounds were in the front, a testament to the fierceness of his struggle. As the great British general, Sir Garnet Wolsey, said, he died a soldier's death. What better could he have done? I'm the History Guy. I hope you enjoy this edition of my series, Five Minutes of History, short snippets of forgotten history, five to ten minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button that is on your left. If you have any questions or comments or would like to make suggestions for another topic for the History Guy, please write those in the comment section and I will be happy to respond. And if you'd like five minutes more of Forgotten History, all you need to do is click the subscribe button. 